Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be introducing about post-quantum cybersecurity. Uh, sounds like a very big, big and scary word, and most people always get scared when I start talking about it. So, um, I have one request that you all must ask questions. Okay, something that you don't understand, something you feel is not right, something you heard on, online and you don't know what it is, please ask questions. I think if we don't ask questions, we don't talk about it, we'll never get better. So this talk is very much you know, driven towards trying to clear some of the misconceptions that uh, the quantum world has created and hoping, at least from my part, you know, hoping to bring Singapore forward from a, a, a quantum readiness standpoint. So this is where it is. At the end of the talk, I will be asking for some volunteers. I'm hoping, we're hoping to create a, a post-quantum quarter or some, some quantum something quarter within div zero itself. So uh, depending on volunteers, uh, in, if it makes sense, then we'll try to create it. And then hopefully we can drive this forward. So I will be uh, asking for it at the end of the talk. But meanwhile, please listen and ask questions. If not, I will ask you all to ask questions as well. So, <laughs> so uh, my talk today, really very simple. We are going to talk a bit about what is a quantum computer. We're going to talk about some truths, some falsehoods, and some things we still don't know. And uh, we don't know, we don't know. So, uh, and then hopefully there will be open discussion, and I want you all to participate as well. Okay, so uh, a bit about me. I, am, uh, I, I just started PQC, so PQC is only a few months old. Uh, it's a tech startup that is trying to work on quantum readiness. So what's the difference between post-quantum and quantum readiness? Hopefully, in my talk, you'll understand a bit more. Uh, I've been in the entrepreneurial line for a while. I did my previous startup, so did. Uh, went back to do my PhD, and now I'm back doing, uh, doing tech entrepreneurship again. If you want to talk separately about tech entrepreneurship, we can. Uh, but maybe not today. Okay, so let's start with something easier. Introduction to quantum computer. What is a quantum computer? And this is like you know, going looking at the elephant. You know, those ten blind men looking at elephant, touching elephant, and saying, "What is an elephant?" Everyone will give you a different answer. My answer is also different, and my answer is really about making making really nature do the computing for you. That's that's really quantum computing. Okay, so. We are trying to make use of the quantum mechanical properties of matter and let it do the computation for you. What we're using right now today are your, your, your laptops, your digital computers, what we call representative. Representative computing means that we use bits or digital bits on your laptop to represent meaning. We give meaning to the bits, then we use the bits to calculate. We manipulate the bits to calculate. But in, the, in nature, not, we don't really need to do this, right? I, I, you show the example here of the, the bubbles. When you put some soap water into a, a beaker itself, the bubbles are calculated with the least tension among everything itself. Did nature go through the calculation? Did they go through uh, regression and everything? No, it just came out like that. The properties of nature performed that operation immediately, and that's how it came out of it. So, so that's a bit of what Quantum, I'm trying to bring you towards what quantum computers can do. So we don't try to give meaning to bits. The qubit itself already holds meaning. And using that, there are already new uh, use cases you know, through like product discovery or, or modeling that they're trying to apply quantum computers for. That's not today's talk. Today's talk is about what happens then under the hood. So you hear about qubit, qubit. What is a qubit? If a, a digital bit is simply one or zero, a qubit, you need to look at it, is the ball. Okay, so it's three-dimensional. Three-dimensional. It's not just, people always say qubit is somewhere between zero and one. That's just one dimension between zero and one. There is another dimension, which is positive and negative. Positive, negative is another dimension. And the third dimension is zero to the imaginary number i. Uh, so if you all remember uh, high school math where you square root uh, minus one, you get i, imaginary axis. So there are three dimensions to the qubit, and essentially whatever data that is, rep is inside the qubit is represented in three dimensions. Right? So yes, when we try to sample and read what is in the qubit, it comes out either zero or one. 
But within the qubit itself, the data is being manipulated and it changes state within the qubit all the time. So how do we change the state to the qubit? It is through the use of gates. And this you all have learned. You have learned in probably lower secondary. What, what are the gates we're talking about? N gate, OR gate, ZOR gates. The same gates, they work exactly the same. You put in zero and zero to a N gate, it comes out zero. You put one and one to an N gate, it comes out one. It's just that now you're going, you're sending in qubits instead of regular digital bits. Okay? The only additional gate that we want to know is this something called Hadamard gate. So this is the first terminology in quantum that we can learn. Hadamard gate. So what are quantum computers? Well, I know something called the Hadamard gate. What does a Hadamard gate do? It takes a qubit and puts it into a superposition. So if you send a zero, a, a qubit with value zero into a Hadamard gate, what comes out is the qubit in a superposition between zero and one. That's a Hadamard gate. That's the magic of the Hadamard gate. And really the combination of Hadamard gate with all the classical gates is just what a quantum computer is. Okay, so that's all there is. There's just add on this Hadamard gate. I'll, I'll share a bit more about what, what the Hadamard gate can do uh, in, a, in a very, very small calculation later. But first term that you learn, Hadamard gate. And you want to sound smart like knowing about quantum computers? Hey, how many Hadamard gates do you, can you support? Wow, sounds very smart. But never mind. So, but we are cybersecurity people today being InfoSec CD. Let's talk about the threat. What is the threat that quantum computers bring? And from a cybersecurity standpoint, it is about breaking public key cryptography. So why, where do we use public key cryptography? I hope you all understand what, what it is. So public key cryptography is used for digital signing, for non-repudiation, for authentication, for integrity, and also for public key encryption or public key exchange, where we then uh, do a key exchange of the symmetric key before we perform confidentiality encryption. So what are the applications affected? Certification authorities, blockchains, secure email, web browsing, remote access. Almost everything that we're doing right now uses public key cryptography. And unfortunately, it means all of these are under threat. When is it going to happen? The working timeline is 2030. So second thing that we remember. 2030. 2030 is the working timeline by many of the, the authorities in the world. NIST in USA, BSSI, uh, BSI in Germany, ANC in, in France. Everyone says, let's work on the timeline of 2030. By 2030, formally they say there is a 50% chance that a hacker with a budget of $1 billion can crack RSA 2048. Okay, so that's the working timeline by many of the authorities. Correct or not, it's still, it's still up in the air, but most of the organizations are working towards this timeline. And 2030 is not very far away. <laughs> it's just seven years away. Okay? Uh, if you're going to imagine how, we, how long we took to migrate from RSA to ECC, uh, in fact, it's not done. There's still a lot of people using RSA. How long we took from triple DES to AES? Hey, by the way, there's still applications using triple DES. <laughs> how long it... We try to move away from Sha Wan, which they finally, which they finally killed Sha Wan. That's we're talking about the range of 15 to 25 years to, to get rid of an algorithm. Uh, this has seven years, and most people haven't even started. <laughs> that, 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 that is the complexity and the scary part of it. Right? It's a bit like uh, climate change, right? People are saying that global warming is happening, and then the seas are going to rise by five meters. I mean, yeah, but it's not going to happen tomorrow, so you know, <laughs> we'll figure it out. You know, there's a zero day coming tomorrow, so we'll for for forget about it. But that's that's really the the the, the mentality that a lot of people are adopting, right? I'm I'm not saying it's wrong, huh? It's just that that is the current mentality. So second thing we remember, if we encounter someone and says, "Hey, when is quantum computers going to happen?" It's happening, but when is it relevant to cybersecurity? 2030. That's our working timeline. Okay, so second thing we remember. And let's now get into the nuts and bolts of why we're talking about today. Let's, there, there are some truths 
there's some falsehoods and there's some unknowns. And I really want to get into that because it's been very, very irritating to me. When I talk to many people, it's so frustrating. And, and this is not the first time I'm giving this talk. I've given this talk to a master student, the, the team of master students in SUTD and SUSS as well. Because it's just so frustrating that everyone just thinks so differently. Let's start. What is true? The very first thing is true is that quantum computers can break public key cryptography. That's true. Okay, what are the specific algorithms inside there? Now let's learn some nice words. Shaw's algorithm, S H O R, Peter Shaw in 1990, I don't know, 96, 97, 94, I cannot remember, 1990 something, already came up with the algorithm on a quantum computer that can break RSA. Grover's algorithm is another algorithm you need to know. And please Google for it, go try it out. If you want to code it, it's very easy. You can use, there are several languages out there that you can use to code and try it out, really, it's not that difficult. Uh, these are the two algorithms that are known to break cryptography. Specifically, Shaw's algorithm can break public key cryptography, making existing uh, uh, problems like integer factorization, discrete, discrete lock problems become, ex, uh, become uh, uh, exponentially faster, exponentially fa uh, become, be become so much faster that uh, what used to be like trillions of years is going to be in a matter of hours. That's why we are very scared. Grover's algorithm is a unsorted search algorithm that is able to then speed up what we call brute force search. And this brute force search is relevant for hashing, for symmetric key encryption, but good thing about it is that it is only a quadratic speed up. That means that whatever that is, uh, say, you know, your bit strength of 256, you do a SHA-256, a bit strength of 256, Grover's algorithm weakens it to 128 bit. Okay? Not so bad, huh? 128 bit is not so bad, huh? seriously. 128 bit to 64 is bad, but 256 to 128 is not so bad. The most significant thing about Grover's algorithm, it is that it is optimal. That means it is not possible to find anything faster than Grover's algorithm for a brute force search. Okay, and this is the basis for one of the designs why how we can design post quantum algorithms. Because if you are using a non mathematically structured system to calculate a key and you use like hash or symmetric key-based systems to calculate keys and perform signing, you know, we know for sure that a quantum computer cannot make it faster than a quadratic speed up. If we use 512-bit keys, it will be at worst 256. At worst, uh, which is amazing. Shaw's algorithm is about breaking a uh, uh, public key. We do not know what's the optimal. Uh. We don't know, is there any other algorithm more optimal than Shaw? But we know that there is, it's not possible to find anything faster than Grover. Okay, so already we are starting to understand the limits of where quantum computers can do. Let me do a simple exercise. We talk about Shaw's algorithm, how to break. I, I, I guess I got slides here, but it's going to take me two hours to try to walk through how to break RSA. Uh, if any one of you, have any of you written code to try to break RSA before? I thought you put out your hand. <laughs> okay, uh, it's not that difficult. Okay, uh, you see the lines, 20, 23 lines of code to break RSA. You know, wow, it just takes a very long time to run. In fact, a lot of this is run in very, very short time. What is, is, is about really finding the prime factors, right? So what's RSA? RSA is about having two primes multiplied together to get a modulus, and then we perform this operation that can be used for encryption or signing. If we find any of the prime factors, the system is broken. So it's how to break RSA? Finding one of the prime factors. How do you find the prime factors? You run through this simple algorithm. If you want the slides, email me. I'll give you my email at the end of the, the, the slides. I can email you this. You can, you can play with this. But actually, Shaw's algorithm is only in step 12, which is searching for the order. It's an order finding problem here. Okay, there's just one step that Shaw's algorithm needs to be applied. So bear in mind, when we're implementing cryptography and trying to break, it is about combining huge computers interfaced with a quantum computer in order to break RSA. Okay, it's not so easy to do. 
but doable. And I've already written code that can break, you know, uh, for, for RSA for modulus 15. You know, the quantum, my quantum emulator tells me that the modulus is made of three times five, you know. So the algorithm actually works. Okay, it actually works. And therefore, when a quantum computer becomes big and powerful enough, we can break 2048. Second thing we know is what we call the store now decrypt data problem or the harvesting problem. This is something that a lot of governments, military, and, and uh, healthcare are very worried about. If RSA can be broken, then data that's encrypted with RSA, if stored today, will be broken in 10, in by 2031, 2032, right? When, when, it, when quantum computers become available. So it's the store now, decrypt later problem. If I am already encrypting data, and I'm very sure my data is protected, and I think my data is secure for the next trillions of years, but unfortunately, quantum computers will break it. That is the problem. Are organizations doing it? Yes. In fact, there are a number of organizations who already come out publicly saying that they're trying to store some data to do this. And, and what are we doing about it? Uh, can, we, can we try to prevent this data from being stolen? Can we try to prevent this data from being, from, from being decrypted? Th these are the questions that many of the organizations are asking. In fact, it is so bad until US Congress has already passed a Cybersecurity Preparedness Act. Uh, so it passed the act, Biden has signed. It went through lower house, it went through Congress, and Biden has signed to require all government, all US state, agents, state agencies to submit a list of all their systems that are vulnerable, to go through a whole inventory, check and make sure and find out which are the systems that are vulnerable and come up with a plan on how to fix these vulnerabilities by this year. Okay, so that, that is already happening in US. In Singapore, we don't seem to be very worried about it yet. I don't know why. Uh, so I'm hoping that they will take a look at this because this has already been passed into law. Any questions so far? Very quiet. Eh? I need you all to be a bit more. <laughs> okay, never mind. Let's do this. What we know is false. Uh, and, and so these are a few things that is quite irritating to me. So people, you know, when, when someone says, oh, quantum computers run so much faster than existing computers, that itself is factually wrong. The, the clock speed for quantum computers are actually very low. You know, it's, it's, it's hundreds of kilohertz at best, or you know, it's not even a, a megahertz kind of thing. We're not even reaching the gigahertz that we're running on our laptops. So the reality is that quantum computers are very slow. They perform computations faster, but they itself is not a very fast thing. Okay? They rely on quantum concepts of superposition, interference, and entanglement. And these are how we design the algorithms in order to speed up processing. I have, I have a very small entanglement example here, which I'll run through, but the, just, just, just bear with me. So superposition, as I mentioned, is between 0 and 1. The, the state moves all the time, depending on what gates it goes through. Interference is about biasing the, the data towards a certain, you know, moving it towards one, moving towards zero, moving it more positive or negative. And entanglement, this is where a really fun thing is. So I, I, and I'll walk through this. Uh, uh, again, I hope you can understand this. And this was a simple example that really got me hooked onto quantum computers. You know, after I went through this, then I suddenly, boom, you know, he came out and said, my God, I'm going to do PhD on this thing. You know? <laughs> so, so this is, and this is an example of entanglement. I mentioned the Hadamard gate. Right, so uh, it's reflected here, H. Eh? This, this line here is a, a qubit. So a qubit going through a Hadamard gate. If we pass in 0 and 0 here, there is a 50% possibility it's 0, and a 50% possibility is 1. We know that. Same for this. There's a 50% possibility is 0, and 50% possibility is 1. So, if we are going to sample these two qubits, there is a 25% possibility on each of the outcomes. Okay? Understand? 
This is what they call a quantum random number generator. So if you go out there and people are, you go to Simlim Square, okay, I don't, Simlim is not selling, but you go online and they are saying, we're selling you a quantum number generator. Why is it? It's just full of Hadamard gates. <laughs> That's all. The gates are not even connected to each other. They are just running through and giving you random results. Okay, uh, don't waste your money on that. <laughs> but uh, this is it. Now, this is where the magic comes in. Same two qubits now. We use one Hadamard gate, but the second gate we use is what we call a control not gate. The control not gate has a very basic principle. If the control, the, if the control signal is zero, do nothing. If the control signal is one, then not this. Okay, that's all. So if the control signal is zero, do nothing. Nothing changes. If the control signal is one, then not happens on the other, the other qubit. So let me walk through this with you now. The first qubit still zero, zero, one, one. No change, huh? There's no change in the first qubit. Now the second qubit, if this is zero, it stays zero. If this is one, it does a not, which from zero becomes one. What has this circuit effectively gotten rid of? I have now gotten rid of two of the possible outcomes. These two. There's not possible, it's not possible that any of one zero or zero one will ever appear. By simply entangling, entangling these two qubits, suddenly I have cut the solution space by half. And that is the speed up we're looking for, right? Because if now I perform the operations and I get rid of you know, solution sets that will never appear, my solution set becomes much smaller and it's much faster to find the solution. So imagine if I have entangled these two qubits and I take one qubit and move it to somewhere and then I take another qubit and move it to somewhere else. And then for qubit A, I open and see zero. Do I know what's the qubit there? What's the value? Oh, you guys are sleeping. Eh? <laughs> Zero. Thank, thank you. Wow, you won the prize. <laughs> I, I, I don't have, I'll give you a biscuit. <laughs> so that, that is really what we call you know, the, the, the whole entanglement side, how, how the whole quantum internet is supposed to have it happen in the future, where now data moves faster than the speed of light because it, it's already there. Okay? And, and a lot of these concepts of how algorithms can be designed with simple gates like Hadamard gates and a few of these things really just change the whole computational cycle of how quantum computers are. So quantum computers can compute solutions, certain type of solutions faster, but in itself, it doesn't run faster. Yeah, that's, the, that's the first thing you want to know. The second, the second misconception is about QKD, quantum cryptography. So, when you hear, oh, post-quantum cryptography versus quantum cryptography, is there a difference? So post-quantum cryptography, which is what I'm working on, is about using new algorithms running on existing classical or digital systems to defend against quantum computers. Quantum cryptography is about using quantum computers to perform cryptography. Quite different. Quite different. So post-quantum cryptography does not use quantum computers. We don't need to use it. It's just a pure software implementation. It's just pure software that is used to design that, that is designed such that we know the limits of what quantum computers can do and we make sure we design algorithms that do not fall into those limits and therefore quantum computers cannot break these uh, algor algorithms. Uh, what is the status so far? Currently, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in US, has already announced the new candidates for post-quantum cryptography. Uh, they are in the process of announcing the standards. So by 2024, that's just next year, the new standards for PQC will be out. Watch out for them. Uh, they are both in the digital signing and encryption space. Watch out for them. You know, if you feel like you want to get into the world of cryptography, 
try them out. There are not many engineers who know this, and doing this will be great for you, and I also want to hire you, so <laughs> please join me if you can. Uh, that's, that's that. Quantum cryptography, which is about using quantum computers to perform cryptography, is expensive because you need quantum computers, and rather limited in, in, in use cases. So QKD, or quantum key distribution, is the most uh, uh, often cited uh, uh, example. Uh, some of our researchers in Singapore are doing it. I got nothing against them. Uh, it's just that the uh, NSA, the, the US agency, says NSA does not recommend the use of QKD because it is expensive, it's limited in usage, and until QKD can resolve all these problems, they say please use BQC. So. It is not true, therefore, that you must use quantum cryptography to defend against quantum computers. There are existing software and algorithms that can defend against quantum computers. That's the second thing you will know. The third thing we don't now we talk about we don't know. What don't we know? Uh, we don't know when the actual date is. You know, when we're talking about Y2K, we talk about you know year 2000, things will go bad. We do not know, I mentioned that the working timeline is 2030. We do not know really when it is happening. Uh, there are a lot of researchers working on different technologies to try to build a bigger, faster, more general purpose quantum computer, but we really don't know when. It is still, it's still the working timeline of 2030, 50% chance for a billion dollars. True or not, we do not know. That still remains to be seen. What you want to know from here is we want to monitor the number of qubits that are being announced. So uh, if, you, if you are hearing the news, you know, Google announced a 50, 54 qubit and uh, this and that. So IBM has uh, most recently announced 433 qubits. 433 qubit quantum computer cannot break RSA. Uh, RSA 2048 needs somewhere around 2n plus 2. So it's 2, two times 2. So 4,096, about 4,100 qubits. It needs about 4,100 general purpose, uh, resilient, uh, fault tolerant qubits to break RSA 2048. ECC, elliptic curve, needs 6n plus 2, 6n plus 3, sorry, uh, which is, so for ECC uh, 256 bit key, it needs somewhere around 2,500, 2,600 qubits to break. So we're not there yet, we're getting there. If you start to see the qubits start to creep to the thousands and the low thousands, then we know we're getting there. So that's, that's where you want to know. The second thing we don't know, and it's uh, something very close to my heart, is about scams. With, with every new technology, the bad guys will always figure out how to use it first. <laughs> that's, that's really the thing. And it's not about trying to break cryptography. I mean, we, we know about the store now, decrypt later thing, but it's about scams. Right now, you're already seeing, you're, you're, if you go, go, you can go and buy, you can buy a, a, a quantum computer online. They, they give you a box, a very, very heavy 40 kilogram box. And they say that the, the two qubits inside that, that, that box. What a waste of time. So. Please don't buy those stuff. <laughs> to, to give you an analogy of where all the supercomputers in the world added together can perform, can emulate a, a, a quantum computer for up to somewhere around 49, 50 qubits. Okay, that's, that's all it is. My laptop running a quantum emulator can already emulate 19 to 20 qubits. Same for yours, I guess it's about there. So, so Buying a two qubit quantum computer, total BS. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, I don't know, you, maybe there are too many people with too much money on their hands, but don't do that. There are, there are better ways to spend your money. If you want to try a quantum computer, there are emulators you can download and try and use the algorithms to break, which is what I did. And you can definitely already do a lot of stuff for 19 to 20 qubits. Not too bad, huh? What we should be more worried about is really how the scammers are going to you know, evolve and change. I asked the uh, chat GPT, I asked chat GPT, what kind of quantum scams will there be? Oh, amazing, I tell you, those guys are, he's amazing. So, uh, 
you, you know, on the, the you know going through the, the whole blah 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 here and there this and that. Uh, I, I will skip through the, the, the conversation, but the scam that ChatGPT suggested was that it will be an investment scam. That people are saying that quantum computers can predict better modeling, can predict better outcomes. So a fund that says I'm backed by a quantum computer is likely to will get more investment money in and you know stuff that happens. So, so they were not very clear about it, but the gist was there, and it's amazing. I thought, wow, just chat GPT can come up with something that I didn't even realize. You know? so, so there are things that we still don't know. There are things that we have to really work, work out, uh, but it's coming. Sca frauds and scams are coming. What I, I mentioned about, you know, really don't ignore anything. Please go ignore anything that's less than 50 qubits. Um, look at areas where uh, uh, you need to start building quantum capability by post-2024, because that's when the standards are coming out. And something that is very close to my heart, quantum, quantum annoyance. So uh, does anyone know what is quantum annoyance? You guys are so quiet, I cannot take it. You know, even the master students in SUSS and SUTD were more active. Quantum annoyance is, in, in, in a very layman term, we want to piss off the quantum attacker. Okay, so there are, there are already techniques that can implement quantum annoyance. An example, TLS 1.3. So, uh, you all know TLS? What is TLS? Thank you. <laughs> uh, who was that? You answer. Thank you, sir. Transport layer security. Who is running TLS 1.3 on their organization's website? Who is running TLS 1.2? Who totally don't know whether what version they're using. <laughs> TLS 1.2 is what 80, 70, 80% of the world is doing right now. TLS 1.3 implements perfect forward secrecy where they got rid of RSA as a key exchange mechanism and use ECC, ECDH specifically. ECDH creates an ephemeral elliptical curve key, which is what we call quantum annoying. Why? Because in an RSA situation, a quantum attacker, a quantum capable attacker, breaks the RSA key and now can decrypt everything before, after the entire conversation of when the key is ever used, the entire way. In a perf with perfect forward secrecy, the quantum attacker, when breaking the ECDH key, can only break the ephemeral key, which means it only breaks one session. Only one session. If your key is used for millions of transactions and millions of sessions over uh, uh, several years, the quantum attacker needs to go figure out <sighs> which session do I break? I'm not saying that he won't break, huh? but the, the quantum attacker can only break one session at a time, which is annoying to the attacker and hopefully as what we like to say, you run faster than the slowest person, let the RSA guys get attacked, then you move forward and you don't get attacked. Huh? So, uh, some form of? Uh, um, I mean, it, it starts to get non-standard again, right? You, 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 you want to keep to the standard, you want to do as little as possible, but piss off as much as possible to the quantum attacker. So, if you can, you know, if your boss asks you, what do you learn today at InfoSec, Infosec City? TLS 1.3. <laughs> okay, please just do it. The, the certificate costs the same huh, from the CA. They're going to charge you the same amount of money. But it saves a lot of problems because it becomes quantum annoying. So perfect for secrecy makes sense. There are a lot of other new techniques that are coming into place, but please do it. It's not, it doesn't cost you more. So... That's, that's what it is. So, so that's, that's really where my, my talk sort of uh, uh, finishes. I, I, I want to bring forward this, this concept of quantum readiness, and this is really a, a lot of what my company is trying to do. I'm not trying to sell my company, I'm just trying to give you a heads up. That uh, we've, my, my talk has been very much about cryptography and, and uh, uh, encryption and signing, but there, is actually a lot, there are actually a lot of opportunities beyond this itself. Yes, migration needs to happen. And there's a lot of work, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of people that needs to, and time that needs to be spent on migration. But there are also gaps. The NIST algorithms only provide for digital signing 
and key encryption. Does it do threshold signing? No. Does it do white box cryptography? No. Does it do verifiable, verifiable random functions? No. There are a lot of branches of cryptography that it doesn't, it doesn't cover. In fact, there, there is no threshold, th threshold signing for dilithium or, or any of the new post-quantum signatures at all. So there, 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 there are still a lot of gaps that need people to work on to solve. Threat surveillance. Um, this is closer to what we call the, the harvesting problem. Data, if data is being harvested, encrypted data is being harvested, it has to be moved somewhere, it has to be stored somewhere, it has to be you know, protected against somewhere else. Can we do threat, simple threat surveillance to go figure out who these guys are and get rid of these attacks? Rather than having to try to re-encrypt with different data and do a lot of other ways of performing this, a simple threat surveillance to search for this activity and you have the next 10 years to figure out, <laughs> to, to get rid of them. That's great. Authentication. Um, I, I know the, the keynote speaker in the morning says we need to get rid of passwords, but I don't think passwords are going away. One problem with passwords is that the eight character password using Grover's algorithm becomes very weak. It becomes, it becomes four characters. So we need to double the key size from eight character passwords to 16 character passwords, which is ridiculous. So what's going to happen? How are we solving this? No one's talking about it. NIST doesn't talk about it. Well, go figure. It's lots of opportunities. Validation, uh, an area that I want to do. I, I will skip a little from this. I'll come back to it. I talked about frauds and scams. HR, not enough engineers doing PKI. Business continuity, even if your organization, I, I had a question earlier to, today. Um, one of the CISOs asked me, uh, should I start doing post quantum preparations and all that stuff right now? I said that it is a, it is, the, the, it has to be a whole industry thing. Just because you're early, just because you're fast, just because your organization is already, you know, in the forefront and moved towards post quantum and implemented all of it, doesn't mean life is good. The whole supply chain needs to work. Your, 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 your suppliers, your consumers, your bank, your insurance, your logistics, any of them not quantum ready, you're just as screwed. So it's a problem that has to happen across the whole industry, not just within a single organization. And then there are the regulations and the education in the place. So let's, let's talk about validation. Uh, this is something that I want to do. Uh, it's a, this is a community project that uh, I'm trying to drive within the Div Zero space itself. Uh, quantum CVE. So you're familiar with CVEs, right? Can, can someone tell me what is a CVE? <laughs> Thank you! Oh. It's the very most active table. The rest are sleeping tables, unfortunately. Okay, so thank you, but we are familiar with CVEs. We use it in our daily lives to, to perform all the scans, checks, vulnerability checks, all that stuff. But there isn't a quantum CVE because they are not actual vulnerabilities yet. But you can imagine it to be like a cliff, right? I mean, 2029 is good and then Happy New Year, boom, everyone falls off the cliff and then suddenly the CVE database becomes massive. We do need to start creating a list of vulnerabilities for all this software and they are not real ones yet, but it already can start to value add. That if a project manager starts to say, um, should I use this version or that version, one being quantum secure and one being not, I might be biased towards one, right? And that, can, that decision can be made today. It doesn't need to wait until the vulnerability happens, then we do it. So I'm trying to build this quantum CV as part of the div zero, trying to create a quantum quarter Oh, nicer name, I cannot think of it yet. But, uh, and, and so uh, we're trying to build this whole thing as a community, looking for advisors. I'm trying to hire a community manager. If you're looking for a job, look for me. Interns, I have budget for it. Uh, I have, uh, I mean, if you like to do volunteers, we'll do events. We'll build a whole CV portal. It'll be community-based. If you like your name behind a CVE, you know, saying that you discovered the CVE, um, Maybe this is a chance to do it. Uh, uh, and, and basically just sign up. Uh, you, if you feel uncomfortable with, I mean, get to this form. If you feel uncomfortable filling in the form, sending me an email, I'm happy to talk to you. I'm likely to start to have a 
little link in the Discord chat eventually in Div0. But I'm trying to build this quarter. It will be a community-driven one uh, and looking for volunteers to move it forward. So happy to work with you guys, really. I think that if we can build this whole validation portal, it will be very useful. You'll, you'll put Singapore on the roadmap. And, and, and I would say it's a much more forward-looking thing. So please join us on this. Uh, and now we're supposed to have some open discussion. I, I have seven minutes, but I, I'm struggling to fill these seven minutes. Can I have questions, please? I, I will struggle, I will struggle. I mean, Macalise, Macalise is a, a key exchange algorithm. Uh, it's uh, been standardized by the French, uh, the German authorities, sorry. So the Germans and the Germans have said, we like Macalise, we'll use it. The NIST US guys say, we don't like Macalise because it's fat and slow, we don't want it. So implementing that today, you're gonna, you, you're gonna fall into the whole standards war, right? Because the US is saying no, Germany is saying yes, who wins? Uh, it will be a lot harder to try to take it out eventually, I think. So I will say, let's, let's, let's go the simple way, figure out the whole threat, the threat modeling first. Do a understanding of what are the systems in your organization that are quantum vulnerable, have a list of them, have these as a assets, and understand what needs to be done to fix them. That itself, I think, is really a very valuable thing. If you look at long-term threats itself, TLS, frankly, is not as bad of a long-term threat compared to um, like health databases or citizen databases where you, know, you cannot change anything there. I mean, TLS are probably more transactional in nature where there may be some data, but it's more transactional and probably in 10 years' time, it's inconsequential. I mean, I mean if, if, if you're sending emails to your mistress, that's a different thing. But <laughs> I mean, we, we, we'll keep that aside. But I, I'm trying to say that there are certain applications that have long, long dated data validity. And these are maybe the ones you want to make sure that they're kept offline, don't have your encryption, encrypted data out there, use quantum annoyance and stuff. But going into quantum algorithms today, even though I'm trying to sell them, no. Yes. Uh, and, but in the past, when we looked at the results of that, it doesn't necessarily, uh, this is why I mean, the result in something that suits everyone, like different algorithms that have out there have ended, ended up having different effective values in the long term. Yep. So is there a, is there a competition going on at the moment? Yes, there is. So it started in 2016. Um, last year, 2022, uh, August, they announced the winners of the algorithms. Uh, and they are currently going through a whole standardization process because it's about picking the parameters, right? The, uh, the key size, the, the, the random, how do you do this? Um, the example will be in, in digital signing. I, I, digital signing is close to my heart. In digital signing, what we traditionally always do is hash then sign. You take a blob of data, a big blob of data, you hash it, and then you sign the hash. If you look at what's happening in the post-quantum algorithms, they say, no, we don't want hash then sign. We want to hash while signing. So the signature will take the whole blob inside there and it hashes as it signs. So that the algorithm is not the, the algorithm will not be broken if the hash is broken. Okay, makes sense. It makes sense from a cybersecurity standpoint, but Imagine you have a HSM and I'm sending gigs of data inside there. If I have a you know remote signing on my phone and and I have to sign a document that's megabytes all the time, I, my data will run out. So there are a lot of practical 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 considerations that has to happen, and all these are being thought out. Uh, there are there are Google groups that you can uh, uh, you can join and you can just listen to them and see what they're doing as well. So I, I do encourage you to do it if you are interested. Yep. So 
it, it is. It is. So, so there are already a lot of free uh, open source algorithms that are being used as well. Uh, please go play with them. I, and, and I would say that immediately, you know, don't, let's not try to fix some of the, just the standard ones like the TLS and all these. I'm very sure when 2024 comes, Google, Chrome will upgrade it. I'm sure Microsoft will upgrade all your Office 365s. So, so the big boys will, are, all, are all part of it and they are already working on it. What is not clear, uh, as I mentioned, are the gaps. So I'm working on places where the NIST algorithms don't work so well. Um, example, uh, blockchain, right? So uh, blockchain uses ECC, elliptical curve cryptography, for the authentication between the wallet and the nodes. All transactions are signed between the wallet and verify the nodes. Can we just replace it with a new algorithm? Technically, it sounds possible, except that if you look at what your wallet address is, it is a hash of your public key. If we remove ECC and put in dilithium, oops, all 50 or 100 million wallet addresses are going to change. And that's, that's massively scary. So how do we then fix this? Uh, I have my solutions. I, we can talk about it after, after this. But uh, these are the challenges that when you use, when you look at simply just from an algorithm perspective, you have this problem. So these are some of the opportunities I see that I'm working on, which is fun. Huh? What? Yes. Well, the one to eight will go away. Let's let's be clear about it. One to eight, because of Grover's algorithm, becomes sixty-four bit key strength. It will go away, so that's going to be gone. Everything will be by default at least two five six. So that's that's clear. Um, two developments. One, NIST is still running a lightweight cryptography, which is a, uh, a symmetric key based uh, uh, contest that's happening. Uh, if you are big on en symmetric encryption, look at AEAD, authentic AEAD, or authenticate data. I can't, I can't remember what the first A stands for. Encrypted authenticated data. Can someone tell me what does AEAD mean? <laughs> but anyway, AEAD uh, where you use AES, but in a way where you, you, it is both encrypted and authenticated at the same time. So this saves uh, a lot of overheads as well. So AEAD is coming in, and AEAD can be made with perfect for secrecy, so it's perfect, it's wonderful, they like it. Um, any other questions? We're just in time, but I can take some more. All of you very quiet. <laughs> you talked a lot about NIST and the NSA. And yes. Yeah. We have. Well, uh, I don't think so. I mean, the, the 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 contest has been very transparent from the start, and uh, if you have been participating in the groups, you will see that they take a lot of inputs from the from the academia itself, and there are a lot of very very powerful academia cryptographers that are inside there. So, uh, I would say that it's not the 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 RNG problem that we saw in the past. When you talk about reaching yep. So so yeah. So it depends on the clock speed and all that stuff that we're going by. So um, you know, so the fastest we're looking at the the super con if we're looking at the, what Google is working on and IBM is working, which are the superconducting ions itself, it will be in a matter of hours. Uh, if it's a Chinese who are working on the optical, it might be months. But, uh, but so, so there's an exponential decrease, but depending on the clock speed. So uh, it will be hours if it's a superconducting one. Any more? Well, I mean, uh, if you are too shy to ask in public, come to me, I'll be here. Uh, if you like to join the community, which I do encourage, please look for me, email me, and I'll try to figure it out. At this moment, my company is only two men, myself and my co-founder, so give me a bit of time, but we, I want to see this through. Well, we have time till 2030, but uh, we want to get this community started. All right, so uh, with this, thank you very much for your time. Yeah.